So our first uh, presentation will be from our Donations Go app team. And they're going to come up now. One. Let's make sure this is working. Yeah, good. All right. Yeah, let's put them down. <laughs> Alrighty. Hello, everybody. My name's Addie. I'm Katie. I'm Danny. Awesome. And for our STEM Capstone project this year, we decided to do a donations um, app for the food bank. It's basically an app that helps um, with donations to the food bank. Um, I'm Katie. I'm the project manager, and I also do communications and designs. Um, I'm Addie. I do communications. I also helped with photos, um, design, and programming. I'm um, Jason, and I did designing, programming, and I tested the app. I'm Danny, and I'm and I'm the designer, the programmer, and the photographer of the. Okay, so for our initial goals for this project, we wanted to create a partnership with the local food bank. That was an essential for our project because without them, we wouldn't be able to make our app. And then um, the second one was to make a functional app that can be used to help out the food bank with donations, and. We really wanted to like create an app that was going to help the community and all. So here's our timeline. We took about two weeks researching and planning our app. That included like talking to our mentor, uh, checking out what programs we would want to use, and then just looking around for like apps that we would want to like look into or learn how to code. And so we spent about five weeks on our design on Figma. And here's where we just mainly focus on designing our app and then kind of like structuring where everything would go and how it would look. And then we took another five weeks transitioning from Figma to another um, programming app called Flutterflow, where we actually programmed the app and then added functions to the buttons for like what it would do. And then our final few weeks, we tested the app and then we checked to see if there were any bugs or issues with the apps that we could fix. So here's our initial design. Um, this was on paper and then one of a uh, few things that we wanted to prioritize was having a calendar and then having a taskbar at the bottom where people could select between the different pages of our app. And yeah, this is where we kind of like our first few steps of designing our app. So here is our Figma design. And here's where we kind of just laid out a more visual look of our app and where we want all the buttons to go and how we would want it to look. And then as you can see, we took out the, the calendar because we wanted to make something more efficient for our users. And then we also took out the taskbar and added a hamburger button instead that would shoot out a bar on the side that would have all our pages. And then, yeah, here's where we added a lot of our text and a lot of um, kind of like our um, what would you say? Key details. Yeah, key details for our app. So this is a functionality part. So for the backend database, we did use Firebase. It's a database, like uh, online database storage uh, provided by Google, and uh, we basically use that to communicate uh with users like bug reports and stuff and uh, also the authentication the login registration is also all done by firebase so let me get into our final product which as jason said we made on flutterflow um so the main idea of our app is it's a pick up and drop off system for donations from the food bank um, so volunteers can go in through the app um, we have our four main pages on the home page volunteer donate about us in my account and then this is what the volunteer page looks like. They can click on volunteer now or my roots and then volunteer now shows any donations that are available um, that people from the community have put in and it shows the exact day and hours that the donations can be picked up. And then they can select that they want to pick up the donation and then on my roots it'll show the donations that they have agreed to pick up and then they can update the status of um, when they've dropped it off at the food bank and then the donate page is a similar layout so people from our community can go into the app 
And then on the donate now, pa now page is where they put in the specific information about the donation. Like I said, the specific day and hours that it can be picked up and then more specifics like the items in the donation and if it needs to be refrigerated or not. And then same thing, my donations shows the donations that they've put in through the app and when they've agreed to be picked up and things like that. And then just some extra pages we have about us um, kind of telling our story about how we made it. And then also kind of the purpose and the reason that we wanted to make the app. And then we also have a my account page and report a bug page. And then here's a link where you can preview the app. Do you guys want me to put it up? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Great. Let me take a second. My computer is working pretty hard right now. <laughs> oh, we don't need to through it. I was denied. Okay. <laughs> I'll see if I can pull it up another way. Um, give me a second so I can get this back. Okay. Yes, we're good. Okay. Okay. And so for some of our tasks. Oh. Sorry, guys. Okay. Is this where you're at? Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay. So for, for some of our next steps for this app are um, testing this summer. We really want to make sure that our app is in its best condition. Um, this will be done with family and friends just to make sure that it's all good to go. And then we also want to do present for the NHS and Key Club organizations at the beginning of next school year. This will allow volunteers to start getting some hours through the clubs at our school. And then we want to promote the app for the community. This will look like posters, flyers, social media posts. Um, and we're also talking about putting it on the food bank app or the website. So for our group evaluation, we definitely had a lot of fun, but we also stayed productive at the same time. We were in the middle uh, of our project. We were kind of worried about not having enough time because we were still dealing with uh, sponsorships from Flow to Flow at the time and stuff. And we were we were an interesting group because I feel like without the STEM class, I feel like we would have never worked together. So it's kind of interesting to get to know each other and uh, work with each other. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I also think, sorry, I also think that we were able to like learn a lot from this like project together. Like I feel like without like having just like someone knowing how to code, like I would have never known how to program and stuff. Like I learned so much just like mm -hmm. throughout and learning from each other. And uh, thank you for Flutterflow for providing us with uh, pro accounts. They were really nice because they are a UI builder, just like Android Studio, but for Flutter. And that just really helped the process a lot. And they are also integratable with Firebase. So it was just so much simpler for us with the website. And then I want to give a huge thank you to our mentor and the um, Lamar County Food Bank. Um, Josh is an operations director at um, one of the food banks in Fort Collins. And he helped us definitely a lot throughout the semester with um, simple design things, um, communication through the food bank. It really, really helped in the end because without him, we definitely would not have been able to uh, make this app happen. And then, of course, with the food bank, um, again, this app would not have happened without them. And then this is our research citations. And then at this point, if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Yes. Yeah, um, did you guys, would you say you divvied up the project into sections like one person did the coding, coding, one person did the graphic design, or did you all four hit every part equally? I definitely say we split it up pretty much, like a lot of it. Like Danny was a lot on like the coding and same with Jason. I mean, Katie were a lot of like communications and talking to like mentors and setting up meetings. Um, but I definitely would say, like, personally, I definitely did help do some of the designing and coding while learning and definitely learned a lot. Yeah, with but, the design, like, we all input our own opinions and, like, made the design together. And then Danny and Jason especially, like, helped actually create the design into, like, a functioning app. And Mr. Warnock asked a question. He's wondering if uh, the food bank is using the app now. Can you guys kind of discuss where you're at. I know you talked about future stuff, but what might how they might be able to implement it. Um, yeah, so 
um, we were speaking with our mentor and we're going to try and get the app started next August. So it's not actually running yet, but like we said, we're going to test um, this summer and then hopefully starting next August is when we'll actually get it in use and like used by the community and by NHS volunteers. Yeah, and we're also still kind of figuring out it's a lot of money to put on the app store right now. So I think we're still trying to figure that out with Josh about putting it on the website and having people be able to download it from there. Um, just because it is a community app, so it doesn't necessarily need to be on the app store. But yeah, that's kind of it. Um, last question. What would you guys say is your biggest challenge of the whole project? Ooh. Besides Flutterflow not getting back to us. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say definitely having to. I would say, I mean, like switching. We switched from Figma to Flutterflow. That definitely set us back a lot because we had a whole like we worked on this design for quite a long time and like we all put our efforts into it and then realizing that it's not going to do its job and having to switch and redo everything that we did basically on Figma to Flutterflow was definitely one of the biggest cool. challenges. Yes. Uh, why did you guys decide to make an app and not like a website? They already have a little website. And yeah, we wanted to help our community and our like main target is um, like older people so that it's easier for them to access and get food there because I know a lot of people want to donate and just aren't able to. We really wanted to make it easy for them and that was like our main priority as well as like making it efficient for people like. Yeah. One more question <laughs> from the audience. Okay. Uh, Mr. Swinton asked uh, since you guys want to use NHS like to kind of test the app, is there a way to track the use uh, like if people are using the app and doing donations, is that something you guys have integrated or is this something that could be added? Later? Like like if if like whether we're, or some like whether or not somebody actually like completes that volunteering or me. Yeah, maybe just tracking how much time you've spent in the whole process as a way of tracking volunteer hours. Just the way I'm reading the question. <laughs> I'm I don't think we can track it yet. You'll have to like manually do it, but it does say that like this person completed this address is uh donation and uh when they did that so and we're still also like talking to nhs about how like the hours will work like if they're going to get an hour for every donation they do or like what that is but that will definitely come more next year when we communicate with like the new nhs board and yeah. all that cool. for sure it is a bit confusing because the nhs teacher you know is not mr roofer like next year so yeah, we're, we're having some trouble. With yep. that, yeah. yeah, there's always uh, all these difficulties when there's transitions and stuff. So <laughs> one of those hurdles we have to overcome. All right. Uh, excellent job, guys. It's fun. Um, I, I did want to mention as the next group's coming up to just the nature of this project really hits the heart of what STEM is about and it's trying to solve some kind of a problem, right? Um, so that was a great, this is a great example of that. All right, let's close this one. Is working okay? Yes. So only the top button. So you don't have anything to do. So I'd like to introduce our team that uh, was working with bioluminescent plants and we'll go ahead and get started. So our project was the bio bioluminescent plant project. Auntie, I'm the project manager. I'm Casey, I'm communications manager. I'm Liesl, I'm the lab manager. Um, and I'm Olivia, I'm in charge of research. First of all, we want to say thank you to our mentors. This project definitely would not have been possible without them. So we have our teacher, Mr. Dana Hauer, and then we reached out to Kristen Gray um, initially, and she connected us with Meredith Cleland, who helped us through the most of our project. Well, we chose this area of science because right now, light pollution is a major like growing problem throughout the world. And so our group seeks to create sustainable, long lasting light sources that are environmentally friendly and we want to use plants to do so. And in doing so, we can replace non, -renew non renewable, environmentally damaging sources of light within our community. 
So the question that we have is what would happen if we inserted a gene coding for bioluminescence into plants? The primary goals were to complete multiple trials, perform research on plants, bacteria, fungi, and other biological processes. And then we also wanted to create relationships within our community with a mentor. When we first proposed this project, this was our initial timeline. So we thought we would have about six weeks to do our research and preparation for this. And then about a month for in lab experimenting. And then for the last about six weeks, doing um, finishing up all of our experiments, compiling our data and getting everything ready to present. OK, so yeah, our project needed a lot of funding in order to actually get these genes going and plants and everything. So uh, DC Oaks was kind enough to let us um, fundraise with them. And with them, we raised five hundred nineteen dollars, um, which was quite a lot of money, which is as much as we needed, basically. But uh, the total cost for our project ended up being um, a little more than five hundred seventy dollars. So uh, after just subtracting the amount that we raised, uh, the school only had to pay um, fifty one dollars for a project. So that was a really big help. Um, and so obviously we had to start with our research. We chose to um, the plant that we were going to modify. We chose um, duckweed. It's an aquatic plant, has a very fast generation time. Um, it's very resilient and adaptable, and it has a rather simple atomic structure. Oh, and then um, mushroom research. We also had to choose our mushroom, which we would be extracting the mycelium from that has the bioluminescent gene. So we chose the Pinellus Sipticus. It's a non-toxic bioluminescent plant, and it, I mean, not plant, uh, fungi, and it needs relatively little care. Um, and yeah, it has the caffeic acid cycle, as many other fungi do, which is able to be transferred. That was our goal, to be transferred into a plant, um, which basically lets a plant be bioluminescent. So that was our goal with that. We also were inspired by the Neonithopanus nambi uh, fungi, which um, we ended up using later some of its DNA, as we'll see. So in order to um, input this caffeic acid cycle into other plants, we needed a vehicle and that would be agrobacterium. Agrobacterium is commonly used in genetic modification of plants. What it basically does it, is it will infect the plant in order to deliver its own DNA into the nucleus of that plant cell. Um, and then we would also be using vectors, which are just plasmids that will deliver DNA fragments into host cells. Um, so for approach one, we made this through our research at the beginning, we would be using an existing vector to deliver luciferase into the duckweed. Um, we would electroporate it into agrobacterium and then vacuum infiltrate that agrobacterium into duckweed. And then we would be introducing luciferin substrates, which basically activate the luciferase and allow it to glow into the duckweed uh, via vacuum infiltration or just their water. Approach we you, with our mentor, we figured this one out to have a second approach. Um, so using this one, we took the genes that work in the caffeic acid cycle of the fungi, um, which were H3H, LUS, CPH, and hispidin synthase. And we took these and we amplified them through promoter and terminator uh, primers. Um, with this, we cloned these genes and were able to put them into, after assembling them, transfer this entire cassette into the agrobacterium, which infected our plants to be able to make them glow. Um, but then really as we were getting started, spring break happened and you all know the climate in Colorado. Um, it killed all of our duckweed and our mushrooms. So that was by far the biggest setback we ever experienced. So we really were back to square one. We had to choose what we were gonna do. So this was really the moment where our team demonstrated um, the greatest adaptability. We really were like, okay, since we're starting over, we might as well expand our um, our project to not only include duckweed, but also maybe some other plants that might be more susceptible to this um, modification, such as tomatoes, strawberries, basil, and um, blueberries. So we chose that and we started up again. So the first step to the process, once the agrobacterium contained the vectors, was to place it in infiltration media and submerge the plants in that infiltration media. Um, once they were placed in a vacuum infiltration chamber and the vacuum pump was turned on, oxygen would be pumped out of the chamber 
and taking the oxygen out of the stomata of the plants allowed the agrobacterium to seep into the plants and infect it. So our primer design, in order to, so primers define the region of the DNA that you're trying to target to amplify. So this helped to select our genes for our PCR reaction. So by doing this, it was a little interesting with the mushroom that we ended up choosing because it wasn't fully sequenced. So we took a mix between the NN gene that we had mentioned before and our Canalis dipticus mushroom and took DNA that we had and DNA from the other mushroom and we were able to figure out the primers from the first and last 23 base pairs of each gene. So the RNA we extracted from the mushroom mycelium is just one side of a full double helix of DNA. So in order to convert that into a more usable and um, uh, stable material, we needed to pair it with an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which would basically pair each base pair, making it a full double helix of cDNA. So we would take that cDNA with our primers that we designed and put it through a PCR reaction. And this reaction would basically double the DNA and would tell us whether our experiment would show results or not. And in order to check if that PCR reaction worked, we needed to check if there was um, DNA segments visible in the gel electrophoresis process that we used. Um, and this process is basically the negatively charged DNA um, pieces would be pulled through the gel toward the positive cathode in the gel electrophoresis chamber. So our discovery, so we had three different vectors that we ended up using. So we had PC, which is to show how vacuum and like how the vacuum infiltration works, if there was any contamination, different things like that. So when hit with UV light, it, it glows. So what we did was we just vacuum infiltrated this first vector, which is what you can see in these two pictures up here, and we were able to see bioluminescence. Um, so, but we were able to also see that there was contamination. Um, our other two were PX. PX was the same kind of modifications, just with the NN gene, and we were able to find the same four genes that we were trying to amplify. Um, and PV, which was the approach one, luciferin and luciferase. Both of these did express uh, bioluminescence in the duckweed, tomato, and stra strawberry plants, um, but wasn't powerful enough to pick up on a camera. Uh, and then with our trials, with the four genes that we were able to amplify. Uh, we unfortunately didn't see anything, which means that the primers might not have been the right combo or different things like that, which you can see here. Um, this is a gel electrophoresis. Okay, so our overall performance as a group, we were really well, uh, really um, committed to this project and we were very passionate about it. So we um, put in a lot of work and that obviously led us to complete a lot of research that you won't even see on this presentation. We have probably over 40 pages of research that we did. Um, and everyone in our group um, was really special. We all had enough knowledge and experience in chemistry, and, um, biology and biotechnology in order to really perform any tasks. So while we were assigned a bunch of rules, like uh, as the research manager, lab manager, all these things, um, we were all really able to do any specialization. So that, that was really useful when, let's say that Casey had a track meet and so she would be gone in the lab since one of us could just like fill in her spot so that it would be more efficient and we could still get things done. Um, so the biggest takeaways from our project, uh, first of all, clear communication is key. This project required a lot of um, communication throughout the community to find a mentor and then communicating and with our mentor to coordinate labs and then just even with our each other and our teacher uh, and then obviously the challenges in our project definitely showed that new research in science will always be challenging and full of trial and error um, and then lastly with enough research and a solid plan all goals of any size can be accomplished if we had more time, uh, we would like to adjust the procedure that we use. We had many difficulties throughout our experimentation and it wasn't really consistent. So if we could go back, we'd like to make a more like structured procedure. And then we also would like to introduce new genes that could enhance the expression of the LES gene by making it glow brighter or for longer. And we want to say a big thank you to all of our sponsors. We had many sponsors on our project. We had Obviously, the Fossil Ridge High School um, Science Department, which we, they let us use their lab space here. Um, and then Zymer Research and Kaijin, they provided us all, all these like RNA kits and stuff in order to do our labs. 
Um, DC Oaks, obviously I talked about them earlier. They're our fundraising partners um, and Cargill. They provided us um, to our mentors, Kristen Gray and Meredith Cleland, as well as giving us a thermocycle. Was that? Oh, no, it was the vacuum infiltration chamber they donated to us, which was a really big help and it'll help many future projects. And I'm very happy that they did that. <laughs> Here's our research slides. All we have four of them. a few. <laughs> uh, hey, go back to the other slide with all the people. Yeah, these are a few bloopers from <laughs> our unofficial sponsorship with <laughs> Lots of Knowledge Snacks. Um, yeah, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask. You guys aren't all wearing your socks today? Like, you <laughs> so, yes, I have some pretty socks. amazing socks. So, yeah, you can see them. I'm also reminded of giving some socks. socks. And notebooks and timers. So yeah, a question from the um, online group here. Uh, were were there any outcomes that surprised you guys, or um, like seemed like they wouldn't work, but they did? Yeah. So um, with both of our uh, PV and PX, we had I think three different trials of it, and the first one didn't have any results, and then the second and the third both did show results. So that was really exciting to see, and we were worried that they weren't going to. So this is definitely it was a surprise at first when we did get results. Yeah, and the PC vector we implemented later on, we weren't originally going to use it, but then our mentor just brought it in. She's like, we can probably use this. So that was back in the time when we were like figuring out if we could use a strawberry or not instead of just duckweed. Um, and that was also a big help because that ended up working well. So. Any other questions? Other questions? Uh, how would the outcome of the project have changed if your plans did not um, die over spring break? Uh, so um, we would have been able so we only were able to do two of the genes, try and amplify them at least. And so we probably would have been able to do all four of them and then insert them into a binary vector and then insert that vector into a plant. Uh, we also would have had more time to experiment with different primers like we could have tried editing them to see if it would work again. Yeah, I think mainly it was a time setback for us. We were able to adapt and change things with our procedure, but um, we had to change things quite a bit when everything died. Yeah, we had almost everything lined up to start and then everything died. So yeah. we had to kind of wait again until we could start again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Step one, keeping the plants alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, one last question before we move on. So how might uh, Mr. Warnock says, how, how might the alteration affect the health of the plant long term? Um, and is it something that could actually make the plant light up? So, so with the way that we did it, the plant would eventually die because agrobacterium is not healthy for a plant. But if we did it when it was like in the germination state or when it was still a seed, it could express it throughout its full life and it would be a lot healthier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with our uh, our trials, the bioluminescence only lasted a few days, um, and that was the same in part of our research. We saw an MIT study, and theirs only lasted like a couple hours before they ran out of bioluminescence. So ours actually lasted longer than theirs, but it was more faint. So I don't know, you give and you take some, but yeah. So excellent. All right, excellent job, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I also just wanted to give a big shout out to Meredith Cleland because she probably spent more time in a high school classroom in the last uh, six months than uh, in a long, you know, so it's been a while, but um, she was super helpful from Cargill, was in here a lot supporting, um, providing some materials we didn't have and working with the limited supplies that we have. So thank you so much, Meredith. I'm not sure if you're on or not, but we appreciate it. All right. We're going to move on to away from biotechnology and move into a little engineering here. So, hey, yo. <laughs> right, I'd like to introduce our team. I've converted a gas go kart to an electric go kart. Oh, All right, who's starting with this? Who's starting? I can start, yeah. Remember, only the top forward button. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so our project name was the e-cart. Um, 
And I'm Joseph. I'm Caden. I'm Jack. And I'm Jason. So pretty much our big goal for this whole project was we wanted to take a gas go kart and convert it electric. Uh, some other smaller primary goals of ours maintain simply. Gosh, I can't talk. Simplicity <laughs> and safety features uh, and some secondary goals, just better handling, easily accessible charging, uh, flare and decoration and reliability. All right, so the main reason for us wanting to go electric is it's better for the environment and new emission standards are constantly changing, which leads to cars not passing tests and then they get sent to the junkyard. And so we wanted a car with lower maintenance because with gas carts, you have to worry about oil and other fluids. With an electric car, you just plug it in. And then the benefits of electric is that it also reduces noise pollution, which is a problem. So this is our initial timeline. Um, this obviously started once we actually got a, got a hold of the cart. So it started with us pulling the old motor. And then once we got the electric motor, we then designed a motor mount for that. After that, we modified the cog to better fit the electric motor. And then we also cleaned the cart after that because it was sitting for a while and had a lot of dirt and oil on it. After that, we started to wire the cart, which was kind of the uh, the last phase before it became almost drivable. So we were just, we wired from the batteries and then to the controller and whatnot. After that, we put everything back together, like putting the seat belts and the seats back on, and then we started to paint the body. All right, so I'm Jason. I was the team leader and I was the head fabricator on the project. So I completed most of the welding and metalworking on the project. Um, I'm Joseph and I was the head painter and head electrician. Um, and as you can see, um, this is some of the unfinished flame work that I created. <clears throat> I'm Jack, I'm head of removal and assistant assembly. So pretty much I use a lot of power tools like grinders and plasma cutters to cut a bunch of stuff off of the cart. And I also help with some of the other guys with designing some of the mounts for our other parts. And I'm Caden and I'm the head of communications and lead photographer. Basically, I was the one who reached out to all the businesses to acquire the cart. And then I also took most of the photos for our group. So our mentor was my dad. He's a mechanical engineer and he currently works as a supply chain manager for Woodward. So the first step in actually converting the cart was getting the cart um, on our hands. Um, we wanted to get a cart donated to us like an old cart because it would cut down costs immensely as this would be the biggest cost of our project. So to start this process, we uh, emailed and called multiple businesses around Colorado um, for potential donations of carts. And after a call with Gateway Park uh, Fund Center, we uh, came across that they had a uh, broken J&J &J Scorpion and we uh, set an appointment with them and retrieved the cart. All right, and then for the research and design phase, our main objectives were motor mounts, cog, battery holder, accelerator, and hardware replacements. Um, with the motor mounts, that just means um, where we would mount the motor on the car for it to best perform. And then the cog was this cog that was stuck, um, which we needed to pull out in order to put the wheel back on. Um, the battery holders were just um, holders made out of scrap metal, which placed our batteries. Um, and then the accelerator, we put a new accelerator in. And then for the, all the hardware placements, that was just what our best judgment was. <clears throat> OK, so once we did all of our research and kind of figured out where we wanted everything to go, it was time mm -hmm. to actually start like disassembling the cart. So the first step of it all is pretty much just taking off all the stuff that we didn't want anymore, right? Like all the gas stuff. So that was like taking off the motor, taking off the like gas ignition because we didn't want to use that anymore, <clears throat> as well as taking off like excess weight because uh, our motor doesn't have as much power as that gas motor did. So we wanted to make it as light as possible so that it could move fast. 
All right. So the build phase was we constructed almost all of our parts out of scrap metal found in the metal shop. And then we would do rough designs, mostly board work to decide what the mounts should look like. And then once parts were built, they were welded or screwed onto the card, depending on what was better suited for the part. And then we have our electrical phase, which is wiring together all the batteries. And then our friends at Casper's Electronics helped donate some parts to us. Just cut down on cost. And this is our initial wiring schematic. So we had our batteries wired in series so we could get 60 volts. And then this fuse was later changed to a 40 which was a recommendation from Brandon, who works at Casper's Electronics. And then these are just some of how the other parts were wired to the controller. Right. And then this was some of the pictures that came with the bodywork and painting. Um, our first stage was the sanding. Um, and then what that was, was just taking um, some circular grinders and just going at it. Um, we just took off the top paint the glossy paint of the blue paint in order for our white paint to better stick um and then we did the base coat of white um and then it took four cans of spray paint and about three days to really get all the blue out um and then we started work on the flames which you can see here we did yellow to orange to red with a blue outline um just for aesthetics um we also put some of our sponsors on the back of the cart and then painted on e-cart on the back and then when that was all done we did a clear coat just to keep everything well oh we obviously learned a lot from this project um but we learned what we learned most was how to use proper safety in the workshop um, also, how to use power tools such as grinders, welders, um, and then also how to uh, wire batteries. These things could all be important if we ever take a job in this field down the road. But we would have liked to do some things better, like uh, use different batteries, because the ones we have right now don't have the best battery life, and we would have liked to have ones with longer runtime. And then also, we would have liked to have a better chain tensioning system, because over time, the chains can get looser, and if we had more tension now, it would just last for longer. <laughs> All right, so surprisingly, this project actually came out cheaper than we thought it was going to be because we got our cart for free and we were able to get some discounts off Amazon. By far, the two most expensive parts of it were the batteries and the motor. Um, and then we were hoping not to buy tires, but when we got the cart, there was like a three inch hole just slashed into one of them. So we had to buy tires and then tubes along with those and then some extra paint just because we wanted to do body work. The fuse was free from Casper's and then we had to get a charger for the batteries. So our anticipated cost was 454. Our actual cost was 490. This is uh, a video and a few pictures of our finished product. As you can see, there's a picture of the cart without the body and then one with the body on with the finished painted body. And there's a small video of from the first time we actually got it running. All right, and these are some of our stats. We had a 25 mile per hour top speed um, with a 17 minute runtime, which we would have preferred longer. But with the batteries we had, it just wasn't possible. Um, it was 450 pounds after all the weight reduction we did with stock being 520. Um, it's 2,500 watts, 60 volts, and 45 amps per hour. And then these are our sponsors, Gateway Park and then Casper's Electronics. Great. <laughs> Uh, we got about three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah. Okay, we're going to just, we got our computer up. We're going to go outside and show the car. Okay. You want me to stop presenting? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, let's see the hall sensor. Again, this uh, was that in the electronic schematics? Is that it? Got a heat, turn it on. It's right here. All right, we'll uh, go ahead and move on to the next I can you guys um actually let's let's give a hand to our e-cart oh they're not in here anymore oh sorry we'll give them a hand i had a few questions but um we're, we don't want to run out of time so are you guys ready to start are you still getting some uh, here's some work out so. yeah we'll so our next group that will be presenting, our next team, uh, created a auto-targeting basketball hoop. I think they're putting some final touches on not too long ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah. You can see that real quick. And you guys are going to pan to that in a bit and uh, show, do a demo, right? So we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll do this. Let me make sure I've got it. Yeah, we'll focus those on the I need like a videography here. here. Yeah, this stuff. Make sure we're good. Okay, let's do it. Okay, let's do it. so we're the auto basketball hoop slide. Um, we found this idea online from a YouTube video from a channel called Stuff Made Here. So we wanted to try our hand at it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Let's see if it's hold on. I, I need to actually uh, change where we're at. Okay, there we go. So I'm Adarsh. Um, I was a programmer and the project manager. I'm Jacob. I was one of the builders and I managed finances. I'm Dylan. I was a builder and I was in charge of photography for the team. I'm Arav. I'm a programmer and I manage communications for the team. Okay, so. Our main goals for the project were split into two sections. We had our building goals and then we had our programming goals. So the first of our uh, building goals was to design and assemble a wooden frame that was robust enough to handle the stresses of a car moving at uh, about 12 feet per second, what we measured it at, in order to allow for a movement system to be attached onto it without any major obstructions. 
And our second one was to install that movement belt system itself. So we were able to move the hoop to where we needed to. And also that leads us into our first program, which was to create an accurate ball tracking vision system with a specialized camera that we use to track the ball as it goes through the air, which will then move the hoop to the ball. And then our final major goal was to program the hoop to make a basket on 50% of shot attempts. And that would be found through refining, testing, and kind of increasing the camera's awareness. All right, so our initial design was largely based off of the stuff made here uh, design. And so you have basically your two uh, like tracks on top and bottom that'll slide left and right, and then tracks going up and down so that you can move up vertically to the wall. Uh, and then we did a lot of research on different materials that we could use. Uh, we researched different types of tracks and different belts and like the benefits of each different type of material. Uh, and then so the first phase was building the frame uh, after we got our donation from Home Depot of all the uh, two by fours and like hardware. Uh, we built a about a six foot by six foot frame uh, and then we added plywood on the corners to make it more like sturdy. And then we, we used L brackets for like the insides and then uh, more brackets on the bottom. OK, so then the next step was creating the cart that would actually mount the hoop and allow the hoop to move freely on the frame. So we first used one inch diameter steel conduit pipes. And we drilled those to the top and bottom of the frame to allow for the horizontal movement. Then we also used two more of those pipes as the vertical cart that the hoop itself would roll on. And so we needed to make sure we had enough space in between those pipes to allow for a belt to run in between and so there's tension on the hoop to where it can move efficiently. And we 3D printed our wheels to fit uh, snugly onto those pipes so that there would be as little chance of it falling off as possible. And then we used wheel bearings inside those 3D printed wheels to allow for uh, way less friction as we're trying to move at fast speeds. And then sort of the final stage of the building process was hooking up the motors and pulleys so we can actually have movement. Um, we 3D printed our pulleys and designed those to have ridges so they would line up with the cogs on the belt. And then we also 3D printed uh, these clamps that would actually grab on the belts so that would like pull the track or pull the cart and hoop with it. And, and this was a big challenge like aligning uh, the 3D prints to the contour of the belts. But luckily we did a ton of testing and got those figured out. So uh, for the electrical phase of our project, uh, this took about one week. Uh, our, our circuit diagram was pretty simple. We had a 12 volt battery hooked up to a power distribution panel, uh, which then distributed power to uh, three sets of motors and controllers. Um, essentially, the, the motor controllers uh, provided instructions to the motors, like what speed to run at and, and percent output and things like that. Uh, it also uh, powered what we call the Robo Rio, which is essentially the brain of the project. Uh, that is where we upload our code to run the motors. And then uh, we had a camera that was connected to the Robo Rio uh, via something called an MQTT server, uh, which is a way to translate camera input. Uh, like what the camera sees into uh, code and data and data for moving the motors. Uh, and so the first phase of programming was uh, ball tracking. And so uh, we used the language Python, uh, which is really suited for uh, image processing uh, and a library called OpenCV. Uh, to track the ball, we use the color filter filter uh, because it's easier to track bright colors like yellow and green. So there's nothing in the background that uh, blends in. Uh, and then we also look for shapes, uh, in this case, a circle, because that's the shape of the ball. And so we have a video. You there. should be able to press the play button. <clears throat> on, the board. And on the board, yeah. Yeah, make sure to pay attention to the yellow ball that you see that was our ball for the testing, and then also the red line that falls along with it, which is the computer. <laughs> Yep, so as you can see, the program uh, kind of follows the path and, and trajectory of the ball as it moves around. So now that we were able to track the ball, we wanted to be able to find the distance or the depth to the ball. Um, so we can do that in a couple of different ways. So the camera that we used for the project was called an Oak D light. 
Um, basically, it has two stereo cameras that are able to tell depth to a target the same way your eyes do. Um, so using that, we were able to tell the, the distance of the target as well as um, when the ball gets closer to your camera, it's going to appear larger in the frame. So you can do a linear or a cubic regression on your calculator um, and find the distance that way as well. Um, we weren't able to implement this, but our plan was to be able to take the change in distance over time um, and generate a physics model for the arc of the ball so we could predict where on the, the track it would land. Um, so once we had the distance, what we wanted to do was be able to take the camera values and then send it to the RoboRio. Um, and in order to do that, we wanted to use something called an MQTT server. Um, so that's a network protocol. Basically, the camera has a stream of information called a topic, and you can publish info to a topic, and uh, everything like the RoboRio that's uh, subscribed to that topic will get an update every time there's new info in that topic. Um, we set up the broker on the RoboRio, and it was a really lightweight and easy to use uh, communication form between the camera and the hoop. Uh, so our final uh, uh, phase of programming was uh, actually controlling the movement and testing the hoop. Uh, to control it, we uh, actually used an Xbox controller and uh, controlled it using the, the joystick um, on, the, on the controller. And we used an algorithm called a PID controller, uh, which essentially does some calculus to uh, move the motors. So, and we also have a video up here that shows that. Mm -hmm. Try again. <clears throat> I'll try. <laughs> this was our second test yeah, on there. Yeah. Yeah. So we were able to get it to move. We had some issues with the, the movement, but mm -hmm. hopefully this will. Is this in the camera frame? Do we know? Uh, not right now, but I'll move it. Oh, let me just make sure it's in there. I think we're good there. Okay, uh, and for the costs, so our initial projected cost was around $740. Uh, our actual cost ended up being um, $647, which was quite a bit less. Uh, this was because we 3D printed a lot of components like uh, gears, uh, wheels for the track, um, and belt clamps and keys for the motors to fit into. Uh, and we also uh, simplified our design, such as uh, uh, transitioning from a more complicated, expensive type of belt to a simpler one that still suited our needs. Um, the main part of this cost was the three uh, motors and their, and their corresponding controllers. Uh, in total, they were $375, but the rest of the cost was made up of other hardware components. And we want to give a huge shout out to the Home Depot on John F. Kennedy Parkway for providing us with the wood that we needed and also a lot of hardware that we still were able to use up until the last week uh, to build the frame and that cut down costs a lot on wood. Um, here's a picture of us picking up the wood from Home Depot. And then also a huge shout out to the CSU Engineering Department and Machine Labs, where they were able to take us on a tour of the buildings and to they allowed us to use some of their facilities and offered their assistance. And we were able to talk to one of the department heads actually and kind of nail down some logistic areas that we were struggling with, such as uh, belt placement, what belts to use. And after we talked with them, we were able to almost immediately buy the belts that we need and they're working great so far. And then for group performance, some of our strengths were uh, thorough discussion during the planning phase, uh, which lasted about uh, three weeks. And so we were able to kind of uh, plan through CAD and also talking with some of our mentors that we had that are also at CSU. Um, and we carried through on tasks such as calling businesses for uh, sponsors or calling with our mentors to uh, make sure that we were doing the right thing and not going to blow up the motors that we had. Um, another strength was we had consistent communicate communication between the building team and programming team during the testing because if you build something that can't be programmed, then there's no point in having both sides of the team. 
And so that was an important aspect for us to keep in mind during the last about three weeks. Um, problem solving, we did really get through that with the logistics of making sure that uh, nothing obstructed the path to hoop or the motors themselves. Um, so weaknesses that we had that we noticed were uh, due to this time of year, everyone's busy there, uh, sports, vacations, uh, other school robotics. events, yeah, robotics also, finals, yeah. yeah, finals. So we weren't able to get into a consistent length of time. We were able to just put our heads down and work. So we had some struggle with that and then connected with mentors and sponsors to receive feedback that also kind of took some time from the project. But we ended up making it work and we were able to work around and find other things to do during that time. So we learned a lot of lessons and results through this process. So um, we learned a lot of like valuable skills. We learned some CAD design skills. Um, me and Arav personally learned how to solder. Um, we learned about OpenCV and using PIDs for uh, control of motors. Um, we also learned some more soft skills. So we were able to plan a project and work with a, a team to uh, complete goals and assign them. Um, and then some of the results, um, the logistics of moving a cart requires really accurate placement of belts and pulleys, um, as well as keeping the tension on the belt really well. Um, in the future, if we had a couple more weeks, we'd like to strengthen the gears and pulley systems. Um, and with a little bit more time, we would have liked to more fully integrate the camera into the process um, along with that physics model. Uh, here's some of the research uh, sources that we used. Uh, the main one being the YouTube video, uh, which we largely based our model off of. And then we have other sources for like calculating uh, lengths of the belts and for learning about on QTT servers. If any questions. Yeah, Daniel. Oh, uh, what what do you have preventing that from like flying off the rails? Um, so from keeping like this flying. Yeah, is it like programs? Yeah, so we have. Off? Yeah, so we have soft limits in the code, so we basically know um, we we know where the the hoop starts, and we can kind of say like don't go past this in code position either way. Um, so we can make sure it doesn't try to go too far or stall out the motor. We also have physical limits where the clamps or where the cart uh, hooks onto the belts. They also can't go past where the gear or the pulley is, wherever the motor is. And so that's kind of also a good insurance. Yeah. Um, Andrew asks, could you use this technology to make a recycling sorting machine for the school? I think referring to the visual part of it, right? right? The yeah. analyzing yeah. what's going through. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's the same. It's the same technical process. Uh, you have a camera uh, of some type uh, through which you take an input uh, like a video or, or some pictures and then you process that using uh, you know programming and translate that into the movement of some sort of like physical motor so yeah, yeah cool because that's a little bit more complicated you might near it need like a neural network instead of the open cv algorithm that we used okay. but yeah cool yeah awesome christian had a question real quick um, yeah did you find any problems with your pulleys being a little untensioned with like values we did so we didn't have the time to have a third tensioning belt uh pulley which is like usually used so we uh tried careful placement of uh like the free pulley and stretched as much as we could uh with while still being able to get the free pulley into the bracket um but other than that uh for this purpose like they're not handling too much Force and we didn't find any like slippage of the belts when we, when we were testing. Good. Tyler. All right. Uh, what prevented you guys like specifically from like being able to like get the calculation of like where the ball is going to go? Like what was the main difficulty of that? Um, we kind of just ran out of time with uh, the camera, so we were able to get it tracking and get some distance, but kind of integrating it with the rest of the project took a lot of time and yeah. That was kind of hard to be able to generate all of that together. I think the complexities of the design of the mechanical parts was probably a little more than you guys anticipated. Oh, for sure. Right? Yeah, it was um, really tough finding. But an excellent example of all the tiny intricacies of the importance of design and you know fitment of things and all that kind of stuff. So I, I just noticed you guys prototyping a lot of stuff and trying it and going back to the drawing board because there's one little thing that you didn't match up or so. Yes. Um, really good. I. I thought a good experience for all of that so yeah cool we got to move on guys so nice job
you guys want to just kind of swing it? Does that work? I think that should be okay. <laughs> You're trapped. You're trapped. You're trapped. <laughs> You're trapped. <laughs> All right. We're going to move back into the realm of biotechnology now. And so I'll uh, have Sophie, Jasmine, and Jillian come up and talk about the research that they did. Oh, uh, let's see. Let's make sure this is working for us. Yeah. Who wants? Yeah. Would it work if we click the screen for like a video? It should. Okay. Yes, it should. <laughs> All right. Okay. Our project is on translation inhibition induced transcriptional bursting. I'm Jillian. I'm Jasmine. I'm Sophie. So our group again, I was documentation, Sophie was communications, and Jasmine was the photographer. We were all involved in doing like the basic lab procedures as well as image processing and data analysis. For our timeline, we initially started with a UV project and we spent the first month in the lab learning the basic procedures like passing, staining, image, and imaging cells as well as using the microscope. Uh, the next month we switched our project and started treating cells with drugs. We put mainly on herring tunnel, and we also imaged the cells. And the last month, we collected data from this from those images, and we also ran control experiments. So we had the opportunity to work in the Sasevich lab at CSU uh, with our mentor Gabe and his dog Milo. Gabe uh, helped us learn all the basic lab procedures and taught us how to use the microscope. We also worked with Tim, and he helped us with the um, image processing and data analysis, and thanks to, to the lab for donating all of our supplies, giving our project zero costs. For our design, we started by writing out um, all the steps for each lab procedure that we would need, and we also drew out diagrams of our project. So each experiment we ran through had the same set of steps. We started by passing the cells because each plate needed a specific confluency, and then we bead loaded because the lab we worked in had cells that didn't have RNA tags in them. And then we would stain the cells, which allowed us to see them under the microscope. And we took the prepared cell plates and put them into the microscope and then imaged them looking for RNA. So our initial goal was to observe the effect of herringtonin on transcription, given that it, it inhibits translation. Uh, the basis of our project is the central dogma of biology. And just to briefly explain that, it starts with DNA, which is transcribed into RNA and then translated into protein. And our project looked at if translation of protein was blocked, how that would affect the transcription of RNA. And our hypothesis was that we would see an increase in transcription. So these are two videos of cells that have been treated with herringtonin. And at the end of them, just like playing. Yeah, sure. At the end of them, you can see a dramatic increase in little red dots, and the red dots are RNA that have been transcribed. You can see all the red dots. So for us to see the cells under the microscope, two tags were be loaded into the cells. Uh, one was a green translation tag and the other was a red transcription tag. And we focused on the red tag, which let us see the RNA. Um, the microscope we used to view the transcriptional intensity was named Dixie, and it was actually hand built in the Stasevich lab by Tim Stasevich and Tatsuya Moriaski. And it was a fluorescent microscope can, that can view at the single molecule level. And I think there's only three labs in the world that can do that. And it allows for us to view it in live cells too. So we use E. coli cells and they were placed in a chamber as seen up there. And we can adjust the temperature and CO2 concentration. And this was our control panel and we use a joystick to control the microscope. So after a bunch of trials and errors, we ended up using herring tonin, which is a translation inhibitor drug. And it comes from this plant in Japan. And it works by blocking the amino acid from binding to tRNA during translation. So this prevents the protein from being formed. To view the effects of herringtonin on transcription, we use a plasmid, which has um, fluorescent tag markers. And from the video you saw earlier, it's the preliminary movie. 
there were two colors, green and red, because we used both the translation and transcription tag. But to simplify things, since we're only viewing transcription, you'll see the following movies are black and white because it only shows transcription. So these two movies show transcriptional bursting. We added the herring tone and drag at five minutes, so zero, 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 five. And you'll see like a lot of transcriptional bursting after 40 minutes. So you can see the white transcriptional spots, they like burst, right? Those are transcriptional sites. And these movies lasted for over an hour. So oh, we um, analyze these movies using, using an Apari image viewer on Python code. We put a mask over a specific transcriptional bracing site we wanted to analyze, and this allowed us to track both the position and intensity of the site. So this allowed us to export the data into a crop array of one specific site. So we have like different information such as the X and Y coordinate position, the intensity and the size of the signal. So then we could use that to create these plots of specific transcriptional sites from different cells. Each row represents a different site, and these are different cells over like different weeks of experiments, and they're just the best sites that we found. So we added the drag at five minutes, and you can see that consistently over different like experiments, we saw a lot of bursting around 40 minutes. So this graph shows the same information, but you can see that there's a spike in transcription at around 40 minutes. So the consistent transcriptional bursting made us wonder if it's like really just the um, um, cer certain like timing and stuff that we use that cause the bursting. So we ran a bunch of controls. So we tried different times, a different promoter, and we assessed if there was a disturbance caused by the media movement from like adding the drug that caused the bursting. So our first control was an eight hour transfection. Usually we image after four hours of like inserting the DNA into the cells. So we tried eight hours instead, and you can see that they're still bursting. So it's not the timing that causes the bursting. Another control we ran was with a different plasmid promoter. Um, across all the experiments you've seen before, we use the ubiquitin promoter plasmid. So it's a different promoter. And um, the one we used for our control was a CMV promoter because we wanted to see if it was like the specific promoter that caused the bursting. So we saw, we still saw bursting, but not as much. And we only run one trial, so I guess it's not really consistent data. But the fact that we saw bursting indicates that like bursting is possible under different plasmids. So it's likely the drug that caused the bursting. And our final control was like just adding media without the drug. So translation was still going and we didn't see any bursting or like increasing transcription overall. Uh, our project showed a strong correlation between the inhibition of translation and transcriptional bursting, but further research would need to be done to assess the quantifiability of this phenomenon and uh, whether transcriptional bursting occurs only under some circumstances. Uh, we gained a lot of experience of working in a lab and we learned about uh, just what it means to do scientific research and the working process of conducting scientific experiments. So our group has a foundation for if we want to pursue career research in the future. The, um, the main benefit for our project would be to researchers because we're looking for the explanation of a laboratory phenomenon and uh, it's uh, not a well-known uh, phenomenon. So uh, some lessons we learned was that research is about trial and error and that uh, sometimes methods and procedures won't work, so you have to uh, try other methods. Uh, we also learned about the importance of communication, um, trans uh, transparency with your group, and making sure that everyone is on the same page. We also learned that mentors are a valuable research who are truly interested and willing to help and want to see you succeed. Uh, we also face many challenges, such as having very long dates, uh, processes like imaging, uh, incubating cells and passing cells took very long time. We also had to try many different techniques and ran into a lot of challenges with that, such as the drug not working, uh, messing up imaging or lab procedures, and cells mm -hmm. dying, which would uh, waste days worth of work. Scheduling was also a problem as lab mentors weren't always available to help us. These are our sources cited. Uh, they just helped us learn about transcription and translation. And also about how the microscope that the lab built works.
Uh, we just want to say thanks again to the Sasha Smart for helping us with our project. And it's clear to see who the star of the lab is. Okay. Your slides. <laughs> uh, um, we don't have a lot of time, but maybe a question or two. <clears throat> ah, Andrew says I work with Tim too. <laughs> awesome. Um, Kristen asks, uh, great, uh, very cool project. What's the biological significance of the increase in transcription? Um, I guess it allows us to like further understand gene expression because transcriptional bursting hasn't really been studied. I think that we read some papers that a lot of scientists thought that transcription just had put up like a baseline level and we didn't really understand what caused bursting of transcription. And it's really interesting that like an inhibition of translation would cause transcriptional bursting. So I think a major implication is um, research in gene expression. Cool. Great. All right. Good job, guys. Thanks. Thanks. We'll have our be careful coming up here because we could trip on a lot of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I agree, Andrew. That's uh, next on my radar to start trying to get some more teams into that. So, only a good time. <laughs> and, oh, okay. I know I'm small. Where do you want to start? Slide one? No, just like, I would think the slide. Yeah. Oh, I think it's at the bottom. Start at the bottom. Go back a little bit. I mean, you know, it could be a little bit. All right. Um, here, 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 here. All right. Back to some engineering. All right. Hi. We are the RC Aircraft Group. Um, so just some introductions. I'm Christian Miller. I'm the team lead, and I assisted with CAD. Uh, I'm Anton Johnson. I did all the other tricks basically and then ended up jumping in, in with some uh, mechanical and assembly stuff at the end. Uh, I'm Nick Gertzen. I did most of the CAD for the project with a little help from Christian. Um, I'm Alex. I'm the programming lead. I basically wrote all the code for the plane. So our design criteria was our goal or our main goal was to create a controllable flyable aircraft that was fully electrically powered. We also really wanted to add retractable landing gear and some cargo we could drop from a door. So our initial schedule was we were gonna finish our research by February 14th and work on our CAD from February 21st to March 31st. And then on April 1st, start assembling and be finished with the whole thing by May 6th. Yeah, so for our initial research, uh, we wanted to figure out a way to create a very aerodynamic uh, fuselage and plane as the power output from electrically powered components at this time was very, very weak. Um, so we found this hybridized uh, fuselage design that took a blended wing design and fused it with your more traditional aircraft design that you would find on a Southwest airline. Um, and then afterwards, we came up with an aerofoil design um, that you can see the coefficient of lift versus the drag there on the right. Um, and then to CAD our main fuselage, we decided to go with the salt system SOLIDWORKS as it could create the necessary geometry for our complex fuselage. So here's our initial design. Um, this was, I think, our third iteration of the actual fuselage. Um, and you can see it has your traditional wings as well as um, a more, not as height wise, but a wider plane so that we could increase our lift across the entire aircraft. And on the right there, we have our curvature of our wings and everything to uh, minimize uh, manufacturing uh, problems. So uh, through this design, we actually found that it wouldn't work as the weight was too large uh, for the amount of lift and the power that we could get out of it, as well as the cost of the aircraft would be too large. So we uh, created a new research and we went in, we took uh, inspiration from the B-2 stealth bomber or 
the new B-21 Raider, which is a blended wing design that creates lift across all surfaces of the aircraft. And we have our um, coefficient of lift versus coefficient of drag um, graph with the um, optimized angle of attack. And we went with about five to 10 degrees of um, angle. So this is our new design. As you can see, we went with a very similar design to the picture in the last slide with the more delta wing. And in these pictures here, we can see where it was cut up into smaller pieces so that we could fit them on the 3D printers. And so to really get our design to show that it would work, we simulated not only the curvature as we saw in the previous slides, and we see that the curvature of the aircraft is a lot nicer for manufacturing, um, but we also simulated the airflow across the uh, surface of the aircraft, and we found that um, during low and high speed air travel, the aircraft would, would always produce uh, lift throughout the entire process. So this was the part of the mechanical stuff I was responsible for. While these guys were completely restarting on our, on our aircraft, I took over the landing gear, which we had some initial concerns with the servo itself bearing too much of the force of the entire plane and breaking or doing something stupid. So we decided to go with a bit of a, a shaft design here, as you can see, which should then put all the force from the aircraft onto these two bushings, which then transfer into the into the body itself and therefore limiting the amount of force on the servo. If you can, if you can see here, the shaft rotates forward and rotates this one kind of rotates up and then back to retract the landing gear up inside of the airplane and then have it come back down. Ideally, uh, we had to have two different types. There was the front with only one wheel and the back with two wheels of ease. And so afterwards, we made some CAD animations of our fuselage actually trying to assemble itself. Maybe. Yeah. Let me try it on my hand. Sometimes yeah. it works better. So I can give us a hand. Yeah. Uh, All right, cool. And this is the other portion I was responsible for was the electrical design. Uh, thankfully, this is a fairly easy task to deal with. I was getting confused in the beginning with some transistors and nonsense. I was making it way too complicated. Short, long story short, you can see there, uh, this is our, our general block diagram. The blue and red at the top there was not mine. Don't know what that was from. Uh, I just kind of threw this together one day as I thought about it. So you can see there, there's the Arduino in the center. That was the, this is the, on the airplane side, that was the brains of the operation, right? It took all the data in and said, okay, let's do this, and then controlled all the servos. Um, one thing you have to be careful here is the different levels of power on the plane, right? To get a power that the motors, which suck down a lot of a lot of power, the servos are not easy to deal with either. And then the Arduino is also at a different voltage level. So that there, there's three different systems running on this plane, ideally. Um, well, that necessarily is three different power sources that the list goes on. So the Arduino talks with the pulse of modulated signals to both the servos and the engine control unit, engine control unit and engine speed controller to ensure that they're rotating and moving at the right speeds. However, that is not the main source of power. That's just telling it where to go. The main source of power comes from the batteries themselves that are wired directly into the parts. And then, as you can see here on this wider picture, there is most of it put together. And they get to do it in the middle, servers on the bottom, motors on the other side, and then the joystick. So, the ground Arduino, which is Arduino Uno, that has 148 lines of code, and the Arduino Mega has around 302 lines of code. I used Arduino IDE and Visual Studio code, which usually is in C and C++ for that very program. So like first, we were planning on doing the Xbox 360 controller, but over time we kind of decided that it wouldn't be really as easy to control a plane with. So we switched over to this joystick right here. And right here is just kind of the two code between that sends 
values from the joystick and converts it to different values that sends to both sides. So it'll turn motors and servos. And here we kind of wanted to measure the battery level because that's very important because you don't want the battery to die midair. So my dad helped me make these equations to get the analog pin on Arduino to measure the voltage level of that um, uh, our LiPo battery, that's what it's called. And then here it just takes these values and sends it over back to the ground so we can read the very voltage that the LiPo battery had. So here are some images of us assembling our plane. As you can see, we have some smaller 3D printed parts because we couldn't fit our whole plane on a, a 3D printer bed. So we can see Alex gluing together some of the bigger portions and Anton here gluing together some of the wings. And then down here, we can see what's going on kind of inside the plane, how we connected all these. These holes are inside of each of these parts and we use them with some metal dowels to connect the plane efficiently. So a big task here, especially with 3D printing, is keeping the project and everybody on board that project organized, right? As you can imagine with printing, what was it? Probably close to 60 different parts out here. Got to keep it all, keep it all on track. So we used spreadsheets to keep, you know, keep track of what's what has been fabricated, the cost of that fabrication. Uh, and this was all divided up in the subsystems and then the, the whole main spreadsheet. Uh, of course, it was also nice. I put some uh, order status stuff on there with Mr. Dan, with Mr. Mr. Dan Howard here. Glad they helped us out with. Um, it's all color coded and conditionally formatted, so that made that job pretty easy. And our total cost of the project was a whopping $741.94. Most of that going to the two systems I worked on, so maybe there's some a bit of a connection there. I'm not, I'm not really sure. Uh, Almost half of the cost went to electrical stuff, and that's just because high power motors and high power ESCs are very expensive and batteries are not cheap either. That's where most of that cost came from. And I'm not sure how the winding gear got so expensive, honestly. I can't remember what parts I put in there to make that expensive, but I apparently I did something. Um, so throughout this, uh, we found that our group had some ups and downs. Um, one of the problems that we had was staying on pace with the Gantt chart as when we created our Gantt chart, we might have, um, I guess, put too much on our plate for what we could actually handle as systems crashed. We had a lot of problems with 3D printing, as you can see up there with um, filament either getting lodged in and, or breaking in the filament. Uh, so we had a lot of problems with that. But throughout this whole design, we um, I would say Nick and I had some great CAD um, help, especially from Mr. Taylor, who taught us how to use SolidWorks. Um, and we had great calculations and great research throughout the entire project, mainly thanks to Anton here um, doing a lot of the coefficient of lift and drag to figure out if our aircraft could truly work. Um, and thank you to our sponsors. Otterbox was generous enough to give us $500 to fund our project. And Cafe Mexicali helped us run a fundraiser through them where we raised almost $100. Uh, special thanks to Keith Hill, who is my dad. He helped work on a PCB, which we used for the Arduino Omega to connect all the servos and motors to it. He also helped debug uh, a lot of the code as well as just come up with ideas and solutions for it. Also, thanks to Dana Hauer for getting parts ordered. He also helped a lot getting stuff 3D printed and also just overall running a great class. And then thanks to Mr. Taylor for troubleshooting some of our solar solid work problems and also allowing us to use a lot of the super glue. <laughs> um, and here are some of our sources that we use. Um, uh, and we can, uh, we have, a lot know, we had a lot of sources, so yeah, these are just a small amount of our sources that we were able to use. And does anyone have any questions? Yeah, we'll take a couple. Yes. Well, uh, two questions. One, what was the final weight? And two, what was the total print hours? A lot. Total, we're not going to go over total print hours. We had about four printers going at all times. Um, 
but total weight came into the fuselage was uh, six pounds um, in total. And then with motors and batteries, I think we came out to 12 and a half, 13 pounds, which for us, we reduced our weight by 10 pounds based off the previous model um, due to um, differences in stressing over the entire weight of the body. <clears throat> Andrew asks if, if it flies. Um, that's not a good no. question. <laughs> Here's a better question. How much longer would you need to get it to fly? Um, first, we need to fix the TAS-6 to get some of our, we have some larger parts that uh, need a larger print bed that we currently have been troubleshooting for over a week and a half now. Yeah. Um, but uh, with print hours, I mean, if we work efficiently enough, we could probably get it done within the next three or four weeks. At the very most, yeah. Yeah. The 3D printer stuff really set you guys back because yeah, yeah we, it was at least two or three weeks. I mean, I don't know how many yeah. moles of filament we wasted trying to get parts to print. Yeah, yeah. Logging through this. Yeah. Very frustrated, but yeah. Thank you for okay. helping us. Yes, yeah, yeah. I wish I could have done more. So, <laughs> all right, well, we got to keep this ball rolling. So, nice job, guys. Hopefully, you get another team with pictures of that for us to they left. Uh, yeah. Finalize it. So two more projects to go. We'll have our All right. So our project was building a mapping sensor. I'm Bridget McGowan. I'm Melina. I'm Tyler. Um, so our original idea was to um, determine bee health from genetic information in honey. Um, it didn't work out. Um, we didn't have a lot of mentors to that would help us, and it was just like really we didn't have a lot of time to do it. And so we decided to do something with greenhouse gases, and that led us to our Stuart um, mentor, <laughs> Stuart Riddick. Um, we took a field trip to Copacos Honey, and we learned a lot of like really valuable information about. The potential um, bee products that we could do, um, but we didn't end up doing it. Um, so Stuart Riddick was our mentor. Um, he's a research scientist at the Energy Institute at CSU, um, where he leads research related to detection of natural gas leaks. Um, he provided us with pretty much all the materials and um, gave us a lot of guidance for the whole project. So these were our roles. I was the project manager, so that meant I was communicating with our mentor and keeping our group on task and like monitoring our timeline. Tyler was in charge of programming, so everything with our, the Arduino we use and also like troubleshooting that when we ran into a lot of problems. And then Melina was the shop lead, so anything we were doing in the shop, she was in charge of. And then here's our goals and timeline, our original timeline. Um, so. We had three goals that they were to program a working methane sensor to build a case for it so it could go outside and to, de to determine which nearby methane source has the greatest impact on fossil. And we were going to do that by seeing like what readings we were getting and the wind direction on that day. So we know like where the methane's coming from and kind of like comparing those on different days. So our original timeline was to spend three weeks wiring and programming the sensor. And at that same time, me and Melina would be building the case. Uh, one week to write that data to the SD card, one week to calibrate the sensor at MedTech. And so that's part of the Energy Institute at CSU. And that's just seeing what our readings are compared to like the readings they're getting there that like they know are right. So that way that gives us an equation we can use to convert our readings to parts per million. Parts, yeah. Uh, and then three weeks to collect data and one week to organize that data and create graphs. So yeah, this is some of the research we did. Uh, with methane, we found that a lower concentration in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide, like it just isn't, there isn't as much, but it's much more effective at trapping heat, which leads to like a larger effects on the planet, even though there's less of it. And then, uh, yeah, it's obviously because of that, it's really important that you have to locate sources and monitor them. And some common sources are cattle, oil drilling, landfills, wetlands, that kind of thing. You can see up there in the top right, there is a graph of some sources of greenhouse gases in the United States. Uh, yeah, and then we used a TGS sensor to sense methane. And the way the sensor works is basically it measures the resistance of titanium dioxide that's in the sensor. And it decreases when there's a higher concentration of methane in the air. So by that, it can do some simple math and just figure out how much methane is in the air. 
and yeah there's just a picture of the sensor and then that's it it's like really hard to see it's really tiny it's sticking out of the bottom of our case uh yeah starting the project so at the start just to like get used to arduino and stuff and the sd card we used a DHT22 temperature sensor, and we figured out how to use readings, get readings from that, and put them on the SD card. And after working on that for a little bit, we moved on to using the actual TGS sensor. And uh, that's where we ran into basically all of our problems and spent most of the project. Uh, yeah, basically, that was a lot. It was not easy. Like, it took forever. Um, ran into a lot of problems where basically, Eventually, we realized that the sensor was broken itself that we were using, so we couldn't really like even if we'd done everything right, we couldn't have had it working. And uh, so, yeah, eventually we were able to get a different one from Stuart and use that. And then after we did actually finish, we and like had a working sensor that was writing to the SD card and our computer and all that, we did end up having problems with the RTC, which is the real time clock, and we used that to like write down timestamps for our data so like when we recorded the data because we needed to know that for weather purposes and all that and everything we're studying we figured out that eventually it always decided that it was april 28th at about 2 p.m and all of our data was writing as that and so we basically figured out that uh workaround that if we moved all of the files from the sd card elsewhere we knew that that was from our most recent data collection and we could manually log the date and time that we were taking it. Um, so for the case design, we made a metal roof and water resistant, water resistant paint to protect the Arduino from rain. Um, and then at the bottom, we like drilled holes from like all the sides so that air ventilation can happen mm -hmm. and just a hole in the bottom so that the sensor sticks out. Um, so building case, um, a lot of our material was like recycled and we were really resourceful. I feel like just finding materials and not adding more cost to our project. Um, we learned a lot of like how to use a lot of different machines in the workshop. And I feel like like that would be really beneficial for like the future, like beyond just this project. Yeah. Right. So here are all the places that we collected data from. So of course we were doing a lot of like daily collection at Fossil. So that's the orange shot. And then at Craig Angus Ranch, because like cows make methane. Um, and then also the Larimer County like dump. Um, because we expected like the methane levels to be higher there. So we wanted to compare that to what we were reading at Fossil. And there's a picture of us at the dump. It was raining that day. And then at Craig Angus Ranch. And then here's just what our readings look like coming from the Arduino. And then here's them in uh, Google Feeds so we can apply the like equation to make it. Parts per million. Yeah, so we had quite a few issues when it actually came to collecting data. The biggest of those being relative humidity. Uh, low relative humidity affects the readings of the sensor. Basically, it's less accurate if there's low relative humidity. And living in Colorado, there is no relative humidity ever. So that kind of made it really difficult to actually collect good data. And we've noticed all the time we had higher readings of methane parts per million when the relative humidity was higher, which definitely showed us that like we weren't collecting accurate data a lot of the times. And then we did have a lot of like a few kinds where we had like really bad outliers. Like you can see like on this graph, like right here, like something weird definitely happened. And we weren't always able to figure out why that was the case, but that was like a big issue for our data collection that could screw with our averages sometimes. And we also just had limited time, so we couldn't collect as much data we wanted to from as many places as we really could have. And yeah, here are some of our results. So the average parts per million at Fossil on all days, no matter what the relative humidity or conditions or outliers was, was about 0 0.69, 0 0.68, whatever. And then um, average parts per million at Fossil, only when we had greater than 60% relative humidity and like no outliers was 1.3 parts per million. So clearly big difference and that definitely impacts the readings of the sensor. And uh, at the dump, our average parts per million, when, when we were there, the relative humidity was like over 90%, like it was basically raining all the time was about 1.1 parts per million. And then, yeah, you can see on this day, the uh, relative humidity is about 80 to 90%, and the readings are like above two most of the day. 
And then uh, this day it's about 20% and the readings are 0 0.05. So it's really tough there. So this, this graph shows some of the patterns that we noticed um, with the methane concentration over time. Um, so with the wind direction, we noticed that from the southeast, um, we measured 1.1 parts per million for methane, and that was our highest measurement. And from the northwest, we measured 0 0.045 parts per million, and that was the lowest measurement. Um, this just shows like the uh, wind direction and speed like during the times that we collected methane concentration. And just because we didn't have like a lot of time to measure, like get an accurate depiction of methane concentration in relation to time and the wind speed, um, it couldn't, it might not be very reliable data. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, if we had more time, we would take it to sen our sensor to other locations and we would gather, we would gather data from multiple weeks um, at the school and so that we could see trends in um, which source has the greatest effect on the fossil um, temperature versus methane concentrations and concentrations during the day and versus the night. So here's just our reflection and cost. So mainly the biggest lesson we learned um, was how we spent our time. Like we really we left a lot of time for programming like that was great. Like we had a lot of time for that. But we kind of assumed that it would go well, like after we like had a working sensor, we didn't kind of like plan for the time it would take for it to just like not work and figure out why. Um, so we kind of wish we spent our time a little more efficiently just in the programming time because we thought we had more time than we did. And then uh, we would yeah, dedicate more time to problem solving in the future, like future projects and stuff like that. Um, but our cost to the STEM budget was really cheap is eight dollars. Um, <laughs> We use donated and recycled materials. So this picture is showing that the wood for the case is all from a leftover like Science Olympiad project. And then um, all the Arduino and sensor parts were donated by Stuart. Um, and then we also had to pay $8 for some extra batteries. So here's our initial goals um, versus our final result. So we did get like our sensor working. We have a like working sensor. We did build the case for it, but we didn't really determine which nearby source has the biggest effect on fossil. Um, just because we didn't have enough data, we couldn't like determine like an actual trend. So that's if we had more data, we would have gotten that. And then here's our sources. Yeah. Yep. And let us know if you guys have any questions. Yeah. All right. Who's going to tell me what PGS stands for? Um. Titanium gatherings. No, I'm just kidding. You know, okay. It's just I don't know. <laughs> uh, what other question? Let's see. How did you guys deal with the outliers in the data analysis? How would you guys respond to that? Um, we kind of just like removed a lot of them because I mean, we couldn't we be at the sensor like the whole time, so we're not sure if like there was something that increased it massively at one moment. So we couldn't really focus on them as actual data points, so we just took them out. That's like why we had two averages, like one when the humidity was good enough for the sensor to work right, and one like for all the data we had. Yeah. I feel like also if you guys had more time to collect data, yeah, you could have dealt with those outliers a little bit more effectively because mm -hmm. you would have known what your trends were and stuff too. Yeah, right? So sure. um, time these guys got told no by a lot of people in the initial month of your projects, reaching out and trying to get uh, projects, uh, stuff like that. So I just wanted to commend you guys for keeping going, even though you really struggled at first to actually nail down a project and a place to do it. So um, any other questions? Uh, great job, guys. Any idea what admission source is southeast of the school? Uh, it's mainly that's about where Greeley is. Yeah. <laughs> Greeley? <laughs> okay. Yeah, we also have some uh, fairly large cattle operator. I don't know if it's dairy farm or what. Not too far from us, too. So. Um, good. So that was from Stuart, by the way. So. Say thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Stuart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. We appreciate you guys. Uh, you support all the support uh, for this team for sure. So, thanks a lot. All right. Thanks, guys. Good job. And we'll have our uh, last team come up.
Six of members of the audience clapping for you all. Maybe they're clapping because we're on the last presentation. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, so here's your back and forth. We have some uh, activity going on <laughs> over here, <laughs> prepping for the. I don't want to ruin it for everyone, but it's getting prepped. So, okay. Oh yes, I'm sorry. I don't spoil the surprise. Okay. I forgot to tell her that we have to type start of presenting. Oh, yeah. So, that's right. Shut up, shut up. Is it You guys could probably start. And they'll work their way up here. Just do three to start. <laughs> You'll get there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Here we go. Start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you want to step a little closer this way, Violet? Yep. Uh, we got the camera over here, so don't stand in front of the screen. Don't back okay. up into the screen. Okay. Here. Here over there. I'll see that for you. I okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you the Tool Press, a aptly named uh, XO arm designed to help alleviate stress and strain that comes to uh, you during overhead and uh, drawn out work. So starting from the far end, we got Maddie. She is one of our general assistants. She helped mainly with our paperwork and building the thing, okay, which took a lot of effort and a lot of work. So thank you very much, Maddie. Sam was our lead for documentation. I'm talking receipts, purchasing things, sending emails, all that jazz. OK, so without him, we wouldn't have been able to do basically anything, including pay. Uh, next up, we have Kyler. He's our mechanical lead. He was the one who designed and manufactured a lot of the components and did a lot of the assembly. And also, thanks to him, we were able to have access to a more professional shop to actually build this sucker. Uh, then there's me, of course. I am the project manager. Uh, I was in charge of coordinating the group and distributing roles, and then after that, assisting with all the general stuff while maintaining functioning of the group. And then Milo over here was our other general assistant who focused mainly on the mechanical aspects. He is our beautiful model for our product, so we designed it to initially fit him, but then also be adjustable for uh, other people. And so our initial product project goal was to make a multiple section uh, exoskeleton to say. It was uh, deemed to be over the top and unreasonable within the amount of time we had. So we decided to settle on uh, the singular aspects of increasing the lifting strength and the uh, lessen the stress on the wearer of our device, leading us to our arm. All right, so early research uh, mainly is focused on other products. We are not the first to do sort of a upper body work strain relief device. Uh, there's one particular, yes, yeah, it's just called the XO with a K, not sure why. Uh, similar device, uh, I believe it uses more like pressure gauges and elasticity. We wanted to go with something a bit more concrete. Uh, there are some, there were some digital, not digital, uh, circuitry based ones. We considered doing that as well. However, as we'll get to in a bit, we deemed that electronics would take a bit too long and would draw our resources. Uh, there's also there was also an already existing alternative on the market that's basically just a table that you put and we thought that's not a good idea so we're going to not do that overall we just decided to then search for mentors that would help with creating just general like uh, exo robotics and yeah other than that we just had to look into what metals to use and then it was just building from there so our timeline i'll be the first to admit was a bit rough uh, we'll get to this later, what we could have done better, but 
Initially, we planned for maybe two weeks of research and initial paperwork. This became four weeks. Uh, so we just kind of went from there with the mindset of, OK, get the objective done, then move to the next phase. And there was a phase that we had planning. This just involved initial writing down. I mean, numbers, a little bit of catting, just real basics. Uh, fundraising and research was actually getting money to pay for the thing. Uh, we got uh, a combination of the Otterbox Fund and uh, a T-shirt funding for, I believe it was a science, 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 Olympiad. science Olympiad. Yep. And that was basically the backbone of all of our funding, along with finishing up the research. We decided not to use electronics again after four weeks, a bit too much. Uh, the initial build was then done using the first wave of store bought material. Uh, we will be demonstrating the initial builds in a bit. And then final build and testing, we finished the build that led to this glorious creation that Milo is putting on right now. So, distracted by Milo. <laughs> Oh, I think this is you. Oh, I'm up. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Cool. Continue. So it began. Uh, don't back and leave. Please don't break. <laughs> just stay right, cool. stop, stop right there. Nice, <laughs> nice. Hi, uh, guys. So at first, we were looking for parts. Like we said, the project began as an electric one with motors and servos in order to. It was supposed to be where you could press a button to get it to raise and lower, but that required much more time than we had to offer and a lot more funding because lifting somebody's arm in a power tool is a lot of weight, rather expensive. We went through blueprints, design after design, trying to get the most effective and efficient design for what time and finances we could deal with. We went around looking for parts and pieces where we could get them. We originally, one of our designs was a gear system where we had a bike chain donated to us by Recycled Cycles. Recycled Cycles. There we go. To this day, the most awkward looks. looks <laughs> us. Oh, yes. And now our progress was, as you can see, this backpack design with spring mechanic system to allow it would just be tension that springs your arm up. All right, so um, it took a lot of prototypes. So originally, um, I just took scraps from uh, our office, which was Hixie Manufacturing, which actually came from the help of our mentor, which was my dad. He let me just go into the office and use any scraps that they had. So our original design actually ended up being way too short and also we broke the springs. So yeah, that was great. And then uh, our next one we ended up making, we had the spring mounts in the wrong place. So then the springs also broke because we didn't have enough. We didn't move it close enough so that the springs wouldn't overextend. And then that led to us also debating how to make the mounting plate, which you can see is the steel plate between the two sections of aluminum. And uh, I just wanted it to be symmetrical because it bothered me that it wasn't. And that's why that's there. There's no other reason for that. And uh, we also ended up ordering springs uh, for the job that we're doing, which also um, was good because they're doing their job. And then we also had a problem of mounting it. Originally, we wanted to do a belt, but um, belts can bend, so that didn't work. So we got a backpack and basically we just put two of them on. Uh, some of the prototypes here. Yeah, they're right there. Yeah. So should, I, should we bring them up or should we do that later? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this I believe was one of our first prototypes to use tin instead. Uh, you know, very stubby, uh, not super Reflexive. Yeah, it didn't uh, this was our second to last design. Almost worked besides that the springs are failing now. Uh, but the other problem was the elbow started to bend out, so we couldn't use that one. That would have been dangerous. Yeah, we didn't really want to break Milo's elbow. That wouldn't have been cool. We ended up doing a lot of testing with uh, material thickness and different materials in order to prevent the arm itself from bending in upon itself and therefore breaking it more than just overextending the springs. Yeah, we did that too. That was great. Ooh, yay. 
So after, now that we've got a working model, which we couldn't get our hands on a hand drill in time, but it can lift your hand and a tool to make working up here much easier. Gives you something to support. Uh, one of our big issues that we actually didn't have time to test because we were working more with the arm itself is the wrist cuff and the strap to put on the cuff. As you can see, it's not quite attached as much as we'd like it to. It's not a big engineering process, just one we would do if we had more time. Um, second is one of our big issues in some of the earlier models was the mounting system. There we go. Uh, when we first put on a prototype with the backpack all working, it started bending. Yeah, <laughs> not because of the steel plate, which we didn't expect because it's steel, but Milo somehow did, so that was cool. It's nice. Second is you can see these backpack straps, at least the ones that go around my shoulder. They, this is more of a specific to the backpack that we used, the um, hunting back for, you know, carrying animals around while hunting. Um, they're not very adjustable. We kind of had to set it to my height and it's a, it can be adjusted. It's just a bit of a process that we would like to cut time off of. And then, yeah, oh no, go on. Okay. So the anticipated price for a project was $344. We managed to cut it almost in half to 162. And that does not include the uh, actual spending. That was simply the final model in its majority. We'd like to thank our sponsors and mentors. We had quite a lot um, of donations. So our, our mentor was Mr. Shannon Hexen, Kyler's dad. He gave us access to his equipment and a lot of material that we used for a final design. Um, Otterbox funded our project. Um, they also were funded through the same grant. And then Mr. Dana Howard, that picture in the right, <laughs> he Thank you for that. bought our materials and also helped us with 3D printing our cups. More so also putting up with our lack of structure. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and that's our citation, and there you have it, folks. Any questions? Yes. How did you guys balance like work and building like prototype sys designs and like actually designing it on paper? So uh, our initial designs were all on paper. Those were um, a lot of basic prototyping and proof of concept ideas. And then as we got into the more uh, final models and such, we converted those to a 3D design using Onshape. Um, and with that, we were able to dial in the dimensions and uh, components and materials and costs and blah, 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 uh, more efficiently than just uh, writing it down and erasing and repetitively doing that to see if it fits. Uh, so I know that you had problems on your previous prototype with the spring. Uh, so with specking that spring out, uh, do you have do you find that you have any problems actually engaging the spring to take any load off your arm? So the springs in there now, the way we designed it is that the springs in their contracted state, which is just the vertical position of the arm, uh, is the most basic position and the most repetitive position that one would use. So uh, it was a simple matter of seeing how much load we wanted our springs to be able to take, and then the distance we wanted our springs to cover. And we took those two, put it into a website, and that website had a list of different springs and choices that we could then pick and choose from based on our situation and how we wanted it to actually function. Yeah, we also put in, um, we did some research. That's why we broke our springs a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to work within a 60% max rule with springs. We were putting 100% of the load on all the time, so they broke really easy. But these ones, I think it was like 20 pounds it's per 25, 30 pounds. Yeah, per no, they're, they're pretty. I think it's like seven pounds per inch of movement. I mean, these yeah. are custom springs. We purchased them specifically for the way that we were working for. Yeah, so that helps. Yeah. Mr. Warnock suggests that you guys make a TV commercial for this. Ah, I see. Oh, boy. <laughs> I think he's still. I can, I can totally do the. These guys can Just come it. to your house and test it out. Of, you know, painting or drilling needs to be done. 
<laughs> you can be the next Michelangelo. That's right. Buy one for ninety nine ninety nine. Sold nowhere near you. All right, yeah, guys. Good job. Um, hey, good job all around, guys. Okay, nice work. Thank you. You guys can get out of here. We'll debrief tomorrow and eat ice cream if that sounds all right with you. Uh,